want to get ready for the word. We're in part two of a series we started last week called The Comeback. Can you look at somebody and say, we're ready for the comeback? <laughs> so last week we talked about uh, coming back to his presence. And he, please hear me. I, I want people to get this. It's not about coming back to church. Coming back to church is great. It's not about, we're coming back to everything that God has in store for us. Do you hear me? Everything that God has in store for us. And today what we're going to talk about is we're coming back to the promise. We're going to come back to the promise because think about this for a moment. I was thinking about promises the other day. Promises are one of the most powerful things that we have, correct? Uh, and so if you think about promises, whether they, when promises are kept, they're powerful, but even when they're broken, they're powerful. They have a powerful effect, don't they? Let me say this. Uh, uh, promises have the ability to build credibility and trust, right? But also build up relationships when, when promises are kept. It has, the, it has the power it has the power to establish hope. But when promises are broken, it has the opposite effect, doesn't it? It breaks trust. It erodes whatever kind of relationship that ever existed. Now, here's, here's what I want to tell you. If you own a business or if you work at a business, your promise means everything, right? If you can do the job as promised and on time and under budget, your credibility and trust will go through the roof. You don't need to promote your business. They will promote it for you. They will say, oh, so-and-so, yes. They will call people and say, you need to hire this person because of your promises. You will have no problem growing your business but because you put your money where your mouth is and you kept your promise. How, how many of you remember the day you said, I do? <laughs> how many promises did you make on that day? Right? You promised to love, to cherish, to honor, to, to respect. You, you promised to, in sickness and in health. For some of us, we're like richer or for poorer, right? We did all these promises till death do us part. And here's the question. How, 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 how many of us have kept the promise well? See, unfortunately, many of us can remember when a promise has been broken. We remember what it, how it made us feel. When that parent, maybe, maybe you grew up in a single parent home and you had one parent that didn't keep their promise and that broke your heart, you know? Maybe you had a spouse break their promise and, and it almost destroyed you. I remember, listen, parents, we're guilty of this. Parents, we're, we're guilty of this. I need this. All right. We'll go to this. Every parent, unless I'm the only parent, and you guys will boo me in a minute. I think every parent in this room has been guilty of what I call little promises that we make to our kids and we break them. What are they? These are the small little promises or the kind of trap we trap ourselves into getting our kids to eat their vegetables or to just behave. We make these little promises. We, we've done some really bad negotiating over the years only to have it blow up in our faces when the kids are like, but you promised. How many of you had that happen before? But can I tell you something? We serve a promise-keeping God. We don't ever have to go back to God and say, but you promised because he always keeps his promises. And can I say this, that this book of promises that he gave us, this book from Genesis to Revelation, every single book is filled with promises for you and me. Now, I need you to know something, that Jesus is our ultimate promise. He's, he's the ultimate. But he, even on top of giving us the ultimate promise, he laid out promises in every single book for you and me, hidden in, in the pages. He put them here, promises to restore you, to save you, to heal you, and he, to call you the head. Come on, it's filled in this book. We're coming back to the promise. Coming back to the promise. Here, I'll give you a little taste. See, in Genesis, he told Abraham, he said, Abraham, he says, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And we are the spiritual children of that promise, right? In Exodus, he promised his children that he would deliver them and take them out of bondage. And he did that, right? In the book of Samuel, he made uh, David a promise. He said, David, you're not just going to have natural sons. He says, but your kingdom's going to be eternal. And we know that Jesus came from David, right? In the book of Jeremiah, he said, I have, I have plans to give you a hope and a future. In the book of John, he calls us sons and daughters. In the book of Romans, he says, he see promises that all things work together for the good of those who love him or According to the, come on, in Philippians, he promises that we can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens us. In Hebrews, I love it, Hebrews. In Hebrews, he gives us a promise and he says, listen, even in your worst moment, because of the blood of Jesus, you can come into the throne of grace and find mercy. That's a promise. 
And in the book of Revelations, he promises this. He says, we win. Because one day Jesus is coming back for the church. And when he comes back for us and he's going to take us up to heaven, we will be victorious. Those are promises. It's time to come back to the promise of God. So let's pray wherever you're at. Listen, if you're in your living room, wherever, right, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, today, Father God, we come back to the promise. Lord, we ask today, let your word permeate our hearts. We ask, Father God, let it go deep, take deep root into our spirits. Lord, right now, Father God, that it will take root and grow and germinate. And I pray, Father God, that every single person under the sound of my voice will begin to walk again on the promises of God. Lord, not because you've kept them, but because we might have strayed. And I pray in the name of Jesus today, give us the faith we need to claim the promise you want us to have. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen, 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 amen. Well, as I said, Jesus is our ultimate promise. But God laid out for us specific promises for us in this book. He's a promise-keeping God, right? How many of you remember promise keepers? I used to love that event. Look what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. It says, for all the promises, all, you see that, all the promises of God in him are yes. I need you to understand this phrase because what you need to see there, he said, in him. So not all promises are for you, only the promises that are in Christ. Only the promises that are in this book are yes and amen, right? To the, why? And then it says to him and amen to the glory of God through us so that when the promise is manifested in you, it produces glory to God. You see how that works? So every promise in the word of God, thank you, is for you. But I, I need you to hear me because what you need to understand right now is that the enemy's tactics right now in uncertain times that we're living in right now is to get you and I to doubt in his promises. Especially when things are dark, when things go crazy, right? When it, it, he wants you and I to doubt in the goodness of God when things get hard and difficult. He wants us to doubt. See, right now in the days that we're living in, he's trying us to doubt God's promises, Right? over our lives, over our marriages, over the church, over your home. He wants you to begin to second guess everything that God has spoken to you concerning your future. So some people don't know, well, what's the point? Jesus is coming. We still have a bright future. You see, and this problem is not a new problem. It goes all the way to the beginning. It goes all the way to the beginning. God created the amazing heavens and the earth. He made all these animals and the water and everything beautiful. And then on the sixth day, he created man. Adam and Eve, okay, the first beings on the planet, he created Adam and Eve. And along into the garden comes the serpent, the, the cunning, conniving serpent that comes in. And what does he do? He, now, I need you to understand that in, in the latter books, in the books of 1, 2nd, and 3rd John, God, G, uh, John calls him the father of lies. That means that every time he speaks, he lies. So anytime you entertain a conversation with the enemy, you need to know he lies, right? Called the father of lies. So what does he do? He gets Eve to question and doubt God's promises, right? Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God made. And he said to the woman, look what he said, did God really say? And this is what the enemy will speak to you. Did God really say that you should? Did God say he was going to heal you? Really? Look at your body. Did God say he was going to deliver you? And look at you can't even stop this addiction. Did God really say the enemy will get you to focus on the natural things that you see before you and forget that the promises are eternal? He wants you to focus on the wrong things. He was trying to get her to doubt the promises of God because anything God says, guess what? It is his promise. And I think that over the last five months that we've been on this weird detour and battling this virus, and we, we've been battling our wits. We've been trying to keep our minds about us, right? Because the enemy's been trying to come against our mind. And we've been tempted to doubt in the goodness of God. We've been tempted. But we've got to come back to the promise. We've got to shake ourselves and come back. And so here's, here's what I want you to do. If you feel, listen, if you want to grow in the Lord, here's what we believe. We believe that when you grow, you take notes. So if you've got your phone, you take notes. you got a notebook, take notes. Why? Because you've got to be able to go back and apply these promises to your life. You've got to apply these. Because so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you four truths regarding the promises of God. So get something to write with. And here's the first one I want to tell you is that God's promises are true in the dark not just in the light. They're true in moments of darkness, not just in the light. Like all of a sudden, because things aren't going right in your world, doesn't mean that God's promises are null and void. No, see, it's so easy to trust in God's promises when everything's going well, isn't it? 
right? <laughs> when everything's going well, when you get a promotion at work, when, when everything, your marriage is happy, you got an, and everything's well. Every, I'm blessed and highly favored of the Lord, Pastor. Blessed and highly favored, right? We walk around with this. Oh, I'm blessed of God. I'm blessed, right? But when things get difficult and you get fired and you get laid off and the dog bites you, guess what? It's really easy to start doubting the goodness of God. It gets really easy, easy, because the enemy's strategy is to get you and I to doubt God in the dark times, even the, when, when he told us in the good time that it was going to be okay. And we start to doubt God. God, is, God I don't know if you're going to come through for me. God, I, I just don't see this happening. Come on, you, start, you know those questions that you say to yourself. That's the enemy t- trying to play mind games with you to get you to doubt God. See, I will never forget. God always allows you to go through things so that you can learn from them and teach others. And I'll never forget the season that God brought us in in 2012 when my wife and I got here and decided that we were going to launch a church. And we didn't know nothing about launching churches. And on top of that, we had no money. We had this big dream. And real quickly, we realized how in over over our heads we really were. And, And I remember... What we thought was a great beginning, I think our launch service, we had so many people help us. We had like 75 people in our launch service. We're like, yes, it's, like, it's exciting, amazing, right? And, and I remember that the, in those days, because we had no money, the only advertisement we had were road signs. And we would go, we'd put these road signs all over the road. And after church, we'd go out and they'd be gone. They'd be stolen. I'm like, there's our money. It's going up and we don't have any. There goes our money. But you see, what what started to happen is it got so hard in the beginning because we didn't know it got so hard. And and week by week, we'd see less people. And then we would set up and tear down, set up and tear down, and only to go out and not find our signs anymore. There were some Sundays that I just wanted to go home and crawl under a rock. It just got so difficult. And listen, listen to me. In just under three, about three months, we managed to grow backwards. You ever seen a plant grow backwards? (laughs) We did the unthinkable. We defied the laws of everything. Our church grew backwards in three months. We started with 75 and ended up with less than 35 people. And less than 35. And then on top of that, because we couldn't pay the bill at the school, we ended up moving the church to our home. Can I tell you something? It was a dark season for me. It was a dark season. It was in those days, you know what, that I would question God and I would question my calling. The idea of throwing in the towel and quitting seemed like the best thing to do. And that's where I was. And I remember every single day, the enemy just speaking to me. Did did God really call you here? Did God call you here? Are you sure about this? Did you hear right? You missed it. Every single day, the enemy would bombard me with those thoughts to get me to doubt the promises of God over my life and over this church. And I tell you, I was close. I was close. But listen to me. There was something about the spirit of God when when you line up to the word of God, even when you feel like you're about to quit. If you would just line your heart up, line your mind up to the word of God. Listen, back then, listen, the devil couldn't get us to quit in 2012 and we're not quitting in 2020. They were not quitting in 2020. Listen, we are called and we're standing on the promises of God. Everything we have and done has been because of this word. Everything. Has been because of the promise of God. Listen to me. I know that this season has been very dark and difficult for a lot of people. And I know that it's gotten you to the point where some of you are beginning to doubt the promises of God. Hear me, hear me. You've been wondering, God, how how much longer? How much longer is this going to, God, are we going to have enough money to make it through, God? And you've been second guessing the call of God on your life. And I know it's been hard and I know it's been difficult. I know it's been dark. But listen to me as your pastor. Don't doubt in the darkness what God has promised you in the light. Come on. His promises are yes and amen. Yes and amen. Is it dark? But it's yes and amen. Jesus. Let me give you the second truth regarding his promises. Is that God's promises require faith. It requires faith. Hebrews, Hebrews eleven six. look what it says. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. You know what I love about this scripture is that God did in detail whether you needed little or much faith. So even if you feel right now you've got a little bit of faith, that little bit of faith, you can please God, right? He says, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly or diligently, in other words, you pursue him, you activate your faith towards him you seek him right so you need to know that your faith pleases god so whether you think it's a little or it's a lot it doesn't matter 
it doesn't matter because a little is better than none. A little bit of faith is better than none. Because look what Jesus said in Matthew 21, 29. Again, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. If you had faith and do not doubt. Again, he doesn't detail whether you need a lot or a little. If you have even a little bit of faith and do not doubt. Not only can you do what has been done to this fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. That's God's promise. If we have, if we use our faith in this manner, which by the way, it requires you to speak. Faith is not a silent quotient. Faith requires you to open your mouth and sound foolish. I was reminded of a mo that movie that we saw. What was that movie that the boy fell through the water, through the ice, and, and his mother was, she sounded like a crazy lady. He, he was in a coma, and the woman sounded like a crazy lady in the hospital telling everybody, please leave, please go, and speak in, speak in faith. What happened? Her son came back to life. It's just like when Jesus kicked everybody out of Jairus' daughter's house when she was dead. He didn't want the doubters. He said, you got to go, and he said, rise up. Faith requires you to speak. You've got to speak. You've got to talk. Faith is active. You've got to speak it even when you don't feel it. Because it's not about you feeling anything. It's about faith, faith, faith. You've got to act. You've got to move it. So here, see, whether it's a mountain of sickness, a mountain of depression, anxiety, maybe it's a mountain of financial stress, stress you have to look at those things and say, you know what, I may not feel well right now, but I, by faith I speak, I declare that I am healed in Jesus' name. You know what, Bills, I speak to you. I command you to shrink and shrivel up. I, Lord, I, come on, you got to speak by faith. This isn't, this isn't some mystical thing. This isn't, some people say, well, that's prosperity. No, this is the word of God. He said, I can speak to the mountain and it has to obey because faith comes from heaven. See, faith is what activates the promise of God. You need to hear this. Faith is what activates it. It gets so right here. It's nothing. It's just the words. But when you apply your faith to it, it turns it on. Right. And get this faith and hope. They ride together. They're sisters. Faith and hope are sisters. Actually, I went to school with faith and hope. They had, I actually did. No lie. They were sisters. And they had another sister named Charity. Yeah. Faith and hope. If you're watching. But I'm not preaching about you. I'm preaching about this faith and hope right here. So listen, faith and hope, they ride together. I need you to understand that faith, I know that in the scriptures, when the Bible talks about a little leaven, leaven's a whole lump is re referring to sin. But I need you to understand that faith is like yeast. It only takes a little. And when you allow, pull up, place that little bit of yeast inside the dough, what does it do? It causes that bread to rise. And any time you operate by faith, it causes hope to rise. It causes hope to rise. It activates the dough. Everywhere faith is to at work, hope rises. Listen, I'll give you an example. When we got the word that Suzanne had that issue and that God touched her and healed her and she showed up in church, that was an act of faith. And what happened to the people around her? Hope rose up and said, well, if God did it for her, he'll do it for me too. Hope rises when faith is activated. Do you understand that? Hope is one of the most powerful forces on the earth. And that is what the devil is trying to steal from people today. Hope. He's trying to steal hope. People's hope. Depression is on the rise. Suicide rates are higher than ever. Divorce rates are on the rise. Why? Because he's trying to rob people of hope. But Hebrews 11.1 1 says, now faith is the substance of things. I don't see it, but I hope for it. But then it says faith is what? It's the evidence of things that I don't see. Wait a minute, that pastor. Well, how is faith the evidence of something I don't see? That's because it's tied to the book of Romans that says, I call those things that are not as though they were. That even though I don't see it, I don't feel it by faith, I speak it. And therefore hope rises inside of me. See, there's a hopelessness right now that's rocking the world in a way that I've never experienced my entire life. Everywhere you go, every morning you talk to, people seem hopeless, hopeless to the point where they don't trust anyone anymore. And you see what's going on right now in the, with the streets and the riots. It's just because of hopelessness. See, for them, it's anger, but it's, they're just hopeless. And when you're hopeless, you lose restraint. You lose restraint. They don't trust anyone. The onslaught against hope has created such a hardness of heart to so, on so many peoples to the point where their hope seems obsolete. They treat everyone and everything with suspicion because they have no hope. They've lost hope in the system, lost hope in medical professionals, lost hope in our law enforcement, They've lost hope even in the church. 
But see, I've got good news, people. We have hope. We have a hope that doesn't disappoint. All of God's promises are yes and amen. We have hope in Jesus. You know why? Jesus never disappoints. Never. God's word has the ability to give us hope even in the midst of a hopeless world. Let me give you truth number three. God's promises require God's timing. Now, this may not be the most exciting point I give you today, but it's probably one of the most important. You ever notice that God's timing never lines up with your timing? Especially if you're a planner or a strategist, you like things done at a certain time. You're like, by Christmas in 2020, out, and God's like, in three years. God's timing never lines up with the way we think it should go. And the, the, what, to help you understand this, you have to understand that humans, we have this limited perspective. We have this, we live on a limited timeline anyways, don't we? At best, we live 80, 90 years. At best. God is eternal. Us, God. And we expect God, we tell God, we, God, you, you better do what I told you to do. Do this now, right? And listen, the Bible says for like a day is unto to the Lord, is like a thousand days, a thousand years to the Lord. So there's a story of a man that asked God. He said, God, what's a million years to you? Right? And God said, about a minute. And then the man asked God, well, what's a million dollars to you, Lord? And God said, about a penny. Then the man asked, God, can I have a penny? He said, sure, wait a minute. <laughs> I hope you're laughing at home because there's a little bit of laughter here. It's a really good joke. It's really good. Justin, is there like a laughter button you could press? God's promises require God's timing. See, so it reminds me in the book of Genesis about a young boy by the name of Joseph that at the age of 17, God gave him a dream, an amazing dream for his life. And in this dream, God shows him how he's going to be one day, he's going to become this influ influential leader. But then what does he do? He makes a mistake. He shares his dream with his brothers who, thought he, who he thought loved him. And he shares his dream. And what do they do? They burn with anger and jealousy. And they throw him in a pet pit, leave him for, for dead. But instead what they do is end up selling him into slavery. So here you have this dream. God gives you this dream and now you're sold into slavery. And then he, of course, he gets sold into the home of a very important leader in Egypt where he climbs to a very important role position, almost like the chief of staff of the house. And he has this influence now only to be falsely accused by the man's wife. And then he gets thrown into prison. And while he's in prison, he is forgotten in prison and left to rot. And here's what I need you to understand. 13 years. 13 years from the, God, from the time God gave him the dream, Joseph goes from the pit to the palace. But it wasn't easy. 13 hard years. And I bet you there were moments that Joseph probably in his mind began to think, God, did you forget about me? Did you forget about the promise? But the Bible says that Joseph always did things for the Lord. But he was left in prison to rot. And after 13 years, 13 years. Listen, some of us pray 13 minutes and we're like, God, where are you? I've been waiting 13 minutes. I've been praying 13 minutes. My knees are hurting me, Jesus. 13. Come on, you can't even wait 13 minutes. And here, God, it took him. To, I'm reminded God did the same thing with Elisha when he called him, when he, he gave him. It took him 10 years from the time he was called to the time he received the mantle. Everything, God, there's a purpose to this time span. There's a purpose to this testing that God is doing. And we forget because we have this short-term perspective and we serve an eternal God. I think of God's own people. He promised them the, you know, the, the promised land flowing with milk and honey, right? And what did he do? Because of their lack of faith and disobedience, what, took, what should have taken, took it, taken them 11 days took them 40 years. 40 years because of their lack of faith. And I, I can't remember a time that God has ever come through for us in this church on my timeline. On my, on my timeline. God, we have in this event, Jesus, can you do a miracle right now? No, no, I'm not saying that God's never come through. He just didn't do it when I thought he should have done it. And, and I asked myself, well, why is that? Why, God, do you do that? Could it be that the reason why God makes us go the long way around the mountain, because he knows if we take the shortcut or the easy way, we'll never learn anything. There's something to be learned in that process time, in that transition time. See, there's always something to be learned. It's those experiences that cause your faith to grow. 
You may not like it, but you see, you could either grow during that time or you can shrink back during that time. Proverbs 16, 9 says, in their hearts, humans plan their course. I plan my time. I plan it. It says, but the Lord establishes the steps. Let me teach you what to do when your answer doesn't come when you want it to come. Instead of getting angry at God, here's the position you should take. Humble yourself and say, Lord, what is it that you want me to learn while I'm on this detour? What do you want me to learn? It's very frustrating for some of us who love things planned out. But God, sometimes, God, there's something to be learned. And I promise you that when you slow down to learn it, you will come out stronger than you went in, wiser than you went in. And not only that, but think about this. The reason why God allows you to go through your detour moment is because there are others on the other side waiting to learn from your experience. You're the teacher that God wants to use in that moment. And let me give you the fourth one, the last one. The last truth is that God's promises are the anchor in your storm. Now, I want to take you to Matthew chapter 14, Jacob, because in Matthew 14, Jesus has spent all day on a hillside with thousands of people feeding them and teaching all day long. Can you imagine to be there and eating fish and bread, having a fish fry sandwich and with Jesus, coleslaw, and you know, it's really good. They're sitting up there, a nice crusty, crusty French bread. Come on. <laughs> All these people, thousands of people. It was the first fish fry. It must have been a Friday. I don't know. But they're up there on the mountain on the hillside, and Jesus is teaching. The disciples are with them. They had spent all day. And now Jesus is tired. So what does he do? He, he, does, he begins to dismiss the people because he's tired. He needs to go recharge. And I want, you, I want to pick up, I want to show you what the Bible says in verse 22 of Matthew 14. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. I want you to see this. He didn't ask them to get in the boat. He made them get in the boat. Like when I make my kids go take a shower, and I make, he, it says he made them. I don't even know what that looks like, but he was like, get in the boat, get in the boat, get in the boat, get in the boat. But look it, it says he made the disciples get into the other boat, Number two, to go on ahead of him. In other words, he, he told, I'm going to join you, right? And to go to the other side. There's three things. He made them get in. He said he was coming. And then the other thing, they're going to make it to the other side. Everything he said. Then he, while he dismissed the crowd. He's putting his disciples into the boat. Now, here's what you understand. We know that when Jesus was on the planet, he was all man. He was all God, right? So Jesus is God. Follow me. It's God's will for them to get into the boat and go to the other side. It's his will, right? Verse 23, after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, while he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. So now, all of a sudden, storm rises out of nowhere. Virus comes out of nowhere. There's a storm that has risen out of nowhere, right? right? It's threatening their life. But look what the next one says, shortly before dawn. That's not, that's, wait, 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 Jesus, hold on. He dismissed them and put them in the boat around dinner time because it was getting dark. So he dismissed the people so they can make it. So whatever dinner time is to you, what, five, six or seven? I would say seven, the latest, maybe seven. Seven o'clock, he is dismissing them and he's putting the disciples in the boats at seven. But the Bible says that shortly before dawn. That tells me uh, dawn is usually what, 6 a.m.? 6 a.m. So let's just say from 7 to 6, that's what, 12 hours almost? For 12 hours, the disciples have been on the boat fighting a storm in their own strength. And they can't seem to get anywhere. Why did Jesus decide to have them wait all that time? There's a reason. There's a lesson to be learned. And it says shortly before dawn, he decides, oh, I got, I got. I got to go get my boys. They're struggling. He put them in the boat. And now he's, they've been rowing there all night. Right? We, let's call that rowing all night. Let's call that the coronavirus season. And nothing seems to be working. Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. My goodness to see that. Verse 26. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. 
Now, wait, 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 wait. This is the same Jesus they had just spent all day on the hillside eating fish sandwiches with, right? They heard him preach, but how come they couldn't recognize him now? Why? Because this, you have to understand, this, this was all part of God's will for them. To trust him at his word that no matter what storm you're going to go through, you're going to make it to the other side. They forgot the promises of Jesus. They forgot it. And they said, what did they say? It's a ghost. They said and cried out of fear. Isn't that the season that we're in? But immediately he said to them, take courage. It's I. Don't be afraid. In other words, Jesus was saying, it was my will that put you in the boat. And it's my will to get you to the other side. I don't know what you're dealing with right now, but God says it's my will to put you in that season. And it's my will to get you to the other side, right? It, well, now we know the end of the story. Jesus gets in the boat. They go to the other side. Peter walks on water. That's amazing. But here's what I'm trying to get to. to help, help you understand. If God has called you to it, he's going to get you through it. If God has called you to it, he is going to get you through it. It's time to come back to the promises of God, ladies and gentlemen. We got to learn to hold on to God's unfailing hand. Even in the midst of uncertain storms, God promised, Jesus promised to be our anchor in the storm. So here's a question I'm asking all of you to ask yourself right now in this moment. How am I doing with trusting the promises of God? Am I growing in my faith or have I been shrinking back in my faith? Have I been shrinking back in fear? Have my words been full of fear? Have my words been full of doubt? Where am I? You see, because there are things that God allows for you and I in order for us to grow our faith. I need you to see it this way. When my kids learn how to ride a bike, there's a season and a time where I hold on to the bike. I'm with them, trying to help them balance. But then there comes a moment I have to let go. I have to let them go at the risk of them getting hurt, scraping their knee, falling. But if I don't let them go, they'll never learn how to be a good rider. And what you need to understand is that there are seasons that God bring, brings you through. He's with you for some of it. Then he puts you on the boat and sends you on the other side. Because there is a perseverance and a faith he's trying to teach you. If you never go through the storm, you never grow in your faith. And then he lets you go. You see, God says, I'll get you to the other side. But there's some growing you have to do in the middle. There's some things. He's your anchor. He says, I'm your anchor. Right now, listen, if you're listening, he says, I'm your anchor. I am with you. I will never fail you. Have I ever failed you? <laughs> Maybe you've been in a place where you've doubted in the promises of God. And if that's so, listen, the only, what we need to do is just in this moment, we just need to repent. Just got to repent for coming out of agreement with him, with his word for our lives. We got to repent of coming in agreement with doubt and fear. Really, at this moment, we just got to get to this place where we say, God, you know, just forgive me for breaking my agreement with your promises. Listen, if you're here right now, if you can...